Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Like how I said that, I said that all like regal, right? Patrick Scott Armstrong. Listen to the bass. Listen to the Shure SMB7. Is that what it is? SMB? I don't know what it's called. This is the Joe Rogan mic I call it. Anyway, uh, sounds great, right? Okay, <laughs> can we just get to the episode? Yeah, we have a great one today. In fact, we have something brand new we've never done before. That's right. After 120 something episodes, brand new. This is a new format. Okay, so not not that we're always doing this, but just for this episode, uh, we might do more like this. I think we will. I think I like this. So what we did is uh, we interviewed a couple local businesses here in Austin that are growing fast and very well known, very well respected. Uh, and I've tried both their products and they're awesome and they're completely different and they're amazing podcast conversations and we brought them together. So this is sort of a split podcast. Okay. Okay. And what we're going to do is put up the full unedited version of each podcast uh, on YouTube only. Okay, so this podcast will have them. We're, we're going to split this podcast in half. Okay, so um, that's what's going to happen. So the first podcast uh, interview is going to be with uh, Tom Rosen from Rosen's Bagels. Okay, you're going to get to learn how to make a bagel, how they make a bagel. And just some of the history behind bagels and that it's really cool and how they're different and what they do to set themselves apart here in Austin. Who doesn't love a good bagel? Okay. I did this bagel subscription box from Taster's Table Club. Shout out. Um, this month and every week I would get this box of bagels with all these goodies and stuff. It was awesome. I'm telling you that's that I, I could do that every month. And one of the weeks was Rosen's. And it just happened to work out that way, it, you know. Didn't even set that up for the interview. So look, they're delicious, I'll be honest. And it was great talking to Tom. Um, and so that's the first interview, okay? And uh, yeah, we, we talked quite a bit, so we sort of cut it down, got the best bits. Uh, but again, we'll put the full unedited version as its own YouTube uh, video on our YouTube channel, The Lone Star Plate, okay? Which is growing fast, get on there. It's growing fast. Got a lot of subscribers. Get on there. Subscribe, please. Um, yes. So, and then the second half, check this out. This is with So Chinese Delivery. Okay. TSO, So Chinese Delivery. If you're in Austin, especially up north, you've had them. They're delicious. They, they, they have this different concept. Okay. And what's great about them is we're talking about Chinese food, which has such a, uh, this is such a great podcast. And again, we're going to put up the unedited version of this one as well. Um, I talked to uh, Min Cho, who is the co-founder and CEO. And I talked to Angel Sang, who's the CTO and co-founder. So we had them both on, both co-founders. Great story. We, we just go to the history of Chinese food in America. Guys, y'all are going to be blown away by this. This is sort of a history lesson on both of these, th these interviews. But this one in particular, and you know, we go into just some really cool stuff you're going to want to know about. General Sal's chicken, where that came from, you know, history of this and that, and you're going to be blown away by it. It's really, really cool. Um, and what they're doing with their business, and they have a huge announcement in the episode. I don't want to spoil it, but it involves their delivery cars, and it's something that hasn't been done, and it's super innovative and cool, and that's what they are. This is an innovative company really cool guys and what they're doing with just delivery period. Like they don't have any, you know, delivery fees and this and that, like what you pay is what you pay and it gets delivered. Like that's their big thing. Right. So they're pushing the Anyway, it's just really cool conversation with both these guys with Tom Rosen from Rosen's bagels and also uh, Mincho and angel saying uh, from uh, so Chinese delivery. Great, just great uh, interviews, you know, just r really enjoyed both of these. So we brought them together. It's a really cool episode, right? So again, first one is going to be Tom Rosen, then it's going to be uh, So Delivery. So before we get to these uh, interviews, we have a word from our sponsor, okay? And, and you know what? Actually, let's change it up. 
We're going to take that word from our sponsor and put it in between the interviews to give you a little bit of a break. That, that's what we're going to do. <coughs> okay, let's start that. So, okay. So we have two great interviews today, right? Tom Rosen from Rosen's Bagels and uh, Min Cho and Angel Sang from So Delivery, uh, So Chinese Delivery. And uh, yeah, so let's get started with the, the first half, uh, which is going to be Tom Rosen from Rosen's Bagels. And then uh, there'll be a word from our sponsor after that interview. And then the uh, second interview will start with, uh, I'll do a, I guess I'll do a little brief intro before that, that interview starts uh, with So Chinese Delivery. Okay, so enjoy today's episode. This is really cool. Uh, you can split them up if you want. Uh, you'll know when the break comes, when the word from our sponsor comes, that that's the break for that episode or for that you know particular interview. And again, we're going to be putting up the unedited versions of each, you know, interview with each of them on our YouTube uh, channel. So please subscribe to that, the Lone Star Plate podcast, okay? Or the Lone Star Plate. Just put that in YouTube. It'll come up. I promise. All right. So let's get to it. All right. So here's Tom Rosen from Rosen's Bagels. Enjoy. Got the uh, got the uh, Taster's Table Club. Oh, nice. Bagel subscription box. So it was great. It just happened to work out that yesterday I got delivered your bagels and then I'm interviewing today. Yeah. And we didn't, set, we, and we didn't set that up at all. So I know. Incredibly convenient. Typically, yeah. before some of these things, Steph, Steph and I try to coordinate a delivery. So I'm glad this really this worked out. It was quite fortuitous. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh to be honest with you, I told Max Kunick, who uh, who's actually been on the podcast and uh, who's doing the Taster's Table Club, right? I told him I could get a bagel box delivered every week. I really like this idea of all these little goodies and, uh, you know, the spread. You've got some drinks, too. They make it a whole thing. Uh, yeah, it's it's phenomenal. And the bagels were were are killer, man. I mean, I haven't got through them all. Obviously, I just got them yesterday, but uh, they're killer, dude. So, yeah. Great job. Appreciate it. Incidentally, Max is a good friend of mine as well. We're uh, we're tennis buddies. Um, oh, oh, there you yeah. go. There yeah. you go. Tennis buddies. I love. <laughs> yeah. How I mean, good are you at tennis? Uh, we're we're about four zero. If you're familiar with kind of the how the levels go uh, according to the rankings, so like you know, have some high school experience, but not like college level, not super serious. But we know what we're doing on the court. Okay, right on. Look at you guys. Okay, all right. I played in high school too. I nice. was the worst player uh, imaginable, <laughs> and uh, my team hated me. Uh, I remember uh, actually one particular time. I always tell the story. It's kind of funny. I'm playing a, a match, and my team is on the bus, heads hanging out the window, screaming at me to finish my match so that the, we, I, we can all leave to go back to school like nobody took me seriously i was always the last person to play worst you know it was like they just needed me to hit the minimum uh to get on there but i did it so i didn't have to run like track and off season of football i remember that's yeah. like it's like okay i'm gonna play some tennis let me see i didn't even know what i was doing they hand me a racket <laughs> i was like let's 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 give this a go but i enjoyed the sport a lot it's it's yeah. really a lot of fun to play a lot of aerobics uh, you know, hand-eye coordination, yep. uh, you know, those moments that you barely get the ball right. Like, that's what you're living for. Well, and it's also a psychological game more than anything. You, it sure. is, you, you're on an island. You know, you're yeah. the only one who controls what is happening in your outcome. And it's also zero sum. So your mess-ups are your opponent's gain. Exactly. And that yes. That is where it's just yep. so hard. Yeah. And that's what you're basically doing. A lot. You know, the effort is... I'm just going to keep hitting it over the net till you screw it up. Yep. You know, to, to you screw it, to you make the mistake, uh, inevitably. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, it is a, it is a great, a great game. How does it compare to making bagels? I'm going to, let's try this transition. Oh, How are we going to connect these two? Yeah. What, so, uh, I would say they're both labors of love. You gotta, you gotta put a <laughs> into <laughs> them. Uh, to get to really reap the rewards of them. But when you do, it is incredibly yeah. satisfying. Uh, there's something about the sort of exterior of tennis and sort of the way that it, it presents itself. Uh, maybe I don't think it really matches up with like what the game actually is. In the same way that the bagel has that nice exterior crust that almost disguises a chewy, doughy inside. 
Uh, as the word tennis, you know, has a sort of country cup fru fruitiness to it, but it's really a pretty gritty game as we were talking about in a psychological battle. The bagels uh, are something that that is a really complex, uh, a complex food, a complex experience that that you can't just gauge from its exterior. Yeah, I like this. Bam, you did it, dude. You you found a way to <laughs> to to bring <laughs> to bring those together. I love it. Um, yes. Um, okay. Uh, well, Tom, look, th- this is, I'm really excited again to talk about bagels. So you own a place called yeah. Rose. Am I saying this right? Rosen's bagels. You nailed it. it. Yeah. That's the it. most common mispronunciation people go rosin, like R A rosin. Okay. Rosin. That's rosin. Uh, that is very Southern thing to say, right? The raw. I mean, that's what we do. So, uh, but yeah, Rose with an N, Rosen's Bagels, uh, started about three and a half years. Actually, we're almost a year four, over three and a half, 3.75, 3.8 mark. Hell um, yeah, man. Right on. Rock on. That's yeah. awesome. So how did this start? So it's like uh, there's no physical location, right, of right now. That's no. not how you're that's not how you're you operate this. But which I like this yeah. is a this is this is different. Yeah, and I think uh, in in kind of talking about how the company started, it explains where we are right sure. now. Sure, And so I, I moved to Austin about seven years ago, and I was a graduate student. I was getting my PhD in sociology. I was supposed to study why people eat what they eat. I was very curious about menu decision-making in particular. I'd gone to culinary school, worked in fine dining, and it was... It was just always curious to me why why did X person choose to eat Y dish, sure. and and thought it'd be interesting to study it. So I got into UT sociology program under the idea that I would study that, and turns out that I loved everything in Austin except for graduate school and <laughs> the lack of a really good bagel. So. Um, <laughs> Oh, so yeah, funny. I did. Graduate school wasn't for me, but uh, and when I was kind of especially having a hard time in it, a friend wanted to make some bagels, and I said, "Yeah, man, let's uh, let's try some recipes out." And we we made some. Bagels. Had you ever made bagels before? No, like I mentioned, went to culinary school, worked in fine dining, but baking at that point was not my. Not even else. like when you were a kid or something with grandma or so. I don't know, just some yeah. weird I experience. Mean, as I came to learn, bagels are a pretty intricate process. It's not like you can just like make them like cookies and yeah, that's good true. To go in one sitting, uh, yeah. ours, take, ours take about forty eight hours from start to finish, wow. including that first one that I made with my friend. It was a thirty six hour process. Uh, you barely have enough space in the home kitchen because you need to put your bagels in the refrigerator for a process called retardation. You you shape the bagels and then it slows down the gluten development to be in a cooler environment. So we put the bagels in our home fridge, take out, take up all the space. My <laughs> my roommates were never too happy with me. In fact, I had to buy a separate fridge uh, oh, so God. I could continue that my hilarious my bagel trials. Uh, but yeah, so made it with that friend and fell in love with the process uh, from there. In fact, his turned out much better than mine. We did two different recipes. He at that point was like a more advanced home baker, and like his were his were very good, and mine were like eh, so so. But <laughs> Enjoying the process, having his very good, fresh, homemade bagels, uh, kind of was like, why am I not able to find this here? And um, led to about a six to nine month process of research and development, um, which by what, that I mean. What, let to- me let, quickly just interrupt. Like, what were the bagels like that you didn't like? You know what I mean? What, what was it about them that were they like the ones you baked, for instance? Like, is that how they tasted to you or so? I think, and how do you know what a good bagel tastes like? Yeah, when, when I, right? like right. Where does that come from? So I think those, those are two separate questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll answer the, the second one first, um, which is I grew up in Kansas, also known as the Mecca of bagels. Uh, really? It's a joke. No, that is, oh, that's a like, complete joke. Uh, grew up on the, grew up on got the me. Yeah, Panera's <laughs> of the world were the bagels that I grew up with. <laughs> and and so like what I thought was a bagel for most of my childhood and adolescence was the very soft, almost like just circular. Yeah, roll. I know what you're talking about. And, and so, yeah, me too. Me too. And those are those are like the commercial bagels that you get. Yep, you and get a sleeve of six or eight at the store. Sort Sarah, of thing. The Sarah yeah. Lee's, the yeah. 
yeah, the St. Thomas, the and and like you can get the slightly improved ones at the fresh bakery of Panera. <laughs> and so I went to New York, I went to college in Nashville, but it happened that like all my friends were from New York, just out of a coincidence. And I was visiting them my um, the summer after my freshman year. And one of my friends insisted, uh, he lived in Long Island, or his family lived in Long Island, uh, that we go to his local bagel shop in New York. It was called Long Island Bagel, bagel Company. Um, just like, there's a dime a dozen for bagel shops in New York. It's like uh, every corner seems to have like, sure. their own. And then, yeah. of course, being New Yorkers, they all have their own opinion on which corner store is the best. But he didn't mean to what he thought was, was his personal best. Um, and what I can say was, hands down the best bagel that I ever had. Uh, we got a baker's dozen between three of us. Uh, I had my third. I had four and a half <laughs> bagels in that sitting. Wow. And it was fantastic. And that just, wow. that opened my eyes to what a bagel could be. And yeah. also just like, it was a profound experience of recognizing that the idea, what I had as the ideal, what those Panera bagels that I had growing up, we're just so far off from what the actual <laughs> actual ideal of this product was. Um, and it's just a complete separate category. But fast forward, I, I go back to, you know, living my life in Nashville, um, lived in Phoenix a little bit after college, and then moved to Austin. In all of these major American cities, you can't find a bagel like you can find a dime a dozen in the, in the Northeast. And that confused me, especially as someone who was like confused along their career route and, uh, and then just started to want to kind of make my own. So that's what I came to like think, experience like my first really good bagel. And so to your, which helps answer, I think your first question, which is yeah. what makes a bagel bad? And I think there sure. are two, two problems that you run into with, with bagels. One is you have like just the, the more standardized or commercialized bagel. And that's a product of a process that these companies use, which instead of doing a boil and bake process, um, they use with steam injected oven, which causes, which is supposed to mimic uh, boiling yeah. as sure. it's like boiling. As it's, they're trying to do it at the same time. Yeah. Right? And yeah. It, it doesn't, re it just quite simply doesn't result in. The of same course product. not. Of course. There's just no way. Yeah. And so what you get is on one end of the spectrum, soft circular roll. On the other end of the spectrum, I would say it's something that more closely approximates like a hockey puck. You get something that's like yeah. really hard. Uh, it's just like, it's just, they, they, individuals might be like trying to do the process of a proper bagel, but somewhere along the, yeah. along the line, they're, they're missing a few steps and bagels are made with high gluten flour. That's like part of the way that they get their chew. Might not be treating the dough correctly maybe our overboiling it could be overcooking it, but there's just something that's like, just, it's a little too tough. It's a, it's a delicate balance you have to strike to get that really good bagel that is chewy yet approachably um, edible, frankly. Yeah. Um, and so, so those are the kind of two areas where I'd say you can go wrong with the bagel and finding that sweet spot was difficult. I mentioned kind of the really long R and D process involved going back yeah. to New York talking to a fair amount of folks who had oh wow shops. you did do that doing you did a go back okay that's good that's i it, love that it was it was a nice excuse to visit said friends yeah as, well as like sure. the best form of r&d is just going to eat a bunch of bagels uh, I, I mean you know not to like play around but that's actually mm -hmm. how you do it you have yeah. to go sit down eat you know even not just Right. I'm sure you did this, not just eating, but how they presented it to you, what they gave you, you right? Like what uh, mm -hmm. sides, what this, what that, the seating, this, you probably looked at everything, never knowing what, what you're going to, you know, how far you're going to take it. So you're just sort of absorbing everything uh, as a whole, which I love. I love that. It's a great process. Uh, Precisely. That, and, and you learn what you like and dislike and how you, yeah. if once you kind of get to the stage of being able to make your own bagels or make your own product, whatever it might be, you can figure out how you're going to do your own version exactly. of that. Exactly, yeah. And, and you mentioned one area where uh, something that always frustrated me, even at the stalwarts in New York, is their approach to seeding, which they just frankly seed like dinguses. They're putting seeds only on one side. They're barely, barely putting any on there. So you yeah. cut the bagel open. You got half a plain bagel on one side. Other half barely has any of the seeds just because you're you're cutting it open, some are falling yeah. off. What are you your poppy seed bagel and it's not left to like three poppy seeds on it. <laughs> and so 
uh, I, I made an ideological commitment there to the double side seed uh, at that point. And that's something we do on our bagels. It, and some say aggressively seed. I say it's just right. I, uh, I like that. And I totally understand what you're saying, right? Like when you slice it, you're getting like this weird leftover bagel piece, right? Like it, it's not, it, it's, I don't know. It's been separated from the pack almost. And you did it because you cut it in half. I love the double side seat, but yes, I mean, that's the whole point of the R and D, not just let me taste this bagel and try to replicate it, but because it's a whole experience, right? It's a whole, it's a whole thing. And, and it's also, you know, education, uh, for the customer, if you do it right, you know, yep. and the customers appreciate that they can learn about bagels and, and this and that and appreciate your bagels. That's another level to your business. It's another way to bring them back. Right. There's just so many you know, avenues where that works. It builds a community yep. uh, as well, which is important. Um, I think I, right? I think you're hitting on something else, too, which is tradition and history. Um, yeah. 100%. There are so many foods uh, they are beyond so much. They're there's, there's so much more than the current moment. And yeah. I think bagels for so many folks, especially those who are in bagel deserts of pretty much not the tri Bagel area. deserts. Um, I love that. <laughs> they, they have such a strong connection. I'm that. <laughs> they have such a strong connection to the product. And, yeah, a hundred percent. Oh, bagels for sure, man. And you I, are right. Yeah. And I just think with that comes a certain responsibility to be a steward of this tradition and really do it the right way. Love that, man. What, what a great attitude to have. And that carries down into your product and the people that enjoy them. You know, I know the people that are going to listen to this, uh, you know, are going to enjoy that. He hear that from a business owner. That, that's what you want to hear, man, that they're, they're, you're invested. You're making an investment that way. If I invest in you, it's going to mean something. Uh, and you care about it and you care about the history and the tradition and taking it seriously, because that's also where you're going to get the best bagel from too, is by respecting all of these things and yeah. taking them into consideration, right? If you just like, Oh, my, you know, my, my neighbors think I make the best bagel. Let's open up a bagel shop and right. You don't do it. You just went off of that, uh, which happens a lot in the food business game. Yeah, I've seen yeah. it a, a ton, uh, you know, Oh, uh, you know, my friend Joe says, I might make the best pork tacos. Let's open up a truck. You know, and you're like, whoa, whoa, you, you know, same thing with that. You've got to go research. You got to find out what what's what makes, you know, what makes the people selling good bagels like how did they get there? What are they doing? Because they did the same thing when they went yeah. to start, open up their business. They went and looked around 100%. and ate some other stuff and figured it out and passed on the tradition in a way. And like you said, you filter it through your own vision. And now you've got this this familiar but new thing yeah. um which is great I, look i do you know what i want to talk about is the process of making bagels and we've sort of pe you sort of peppered it in there here and there which i love because most people don't know that there are, are kind of some interesting steps in the process that just you know that don't cook or whatever or maybe cook wouldn't realize that that's there right uh, you know uh so yeah let's let's go through like making a bagel what what yeah. what does that entail so it's the Rosen's bagel that is on your plate the morning it is delivered to you. Uh, was born actually 48 hours before uh, that, that entrance <laughs> into your life. Uh, so the, the birthing begins with uh, a process uh, called a sponge, uh, similar to a sourdough starter. It's a mixture of water, yeast, and flour that we then put in our refrigerator to make sure it's temperature controlled for about 24 hours. And that provides a slight subtle sour base to our bake to our bagel. So it's the base of our bagels that provides subtle sour flavor, sorry, uh, to it. And so that sponge, uh, it also provides some of the wetness in our dough because there's a good amount of water in it. So we add that sponge then to the rest of the ingredients in our dough about 24 hours later. And the rest of our ingredients are high gluten flour, malt, salt, and yeast, and that's it. And so you have five simple ingredients, water included in there as well that you mix together and then you shape them. Uh, and that is a whole process, especially when you go from making 12 to 24 bagels for, for your buddies to making where at this point averaging about 1200 bagels a day. Wow. And, and figuring out how to, how to do that in an efficient manner. Sure. Um, and so, so then you, you make and shape your bagels. Um, 
And as you, you shape them and you put them back in the fridge for that, I mentioned that process of retardation. Is there, is there like a quick insider trick for people listening, you know, listening or, and watching uh, mm -hmm. for shaping them? Is there some like little trick? There's always a trick to doing pasta or to doing this or, right? Yeah. There's always something. I don't know. Is there yeah, something? So the, there's two schools of thought in terms of how you create effectively what the trademark of a bagel, of course, is the, is the circular with a hole in the middle. So yeah. there's two different ways you can go about it. I don't know how many of you are watching this video or listening instead of this podcast, but if you're watching the video, you can see my hands. If you are going the first route, which is actually what I don't advise, but is what a lot of cookbooks will advise, is that you flatten dough to about four inches, a four inch circle, then you press your thumbs up into it, and then you kind of massage around it so you create a bagel. Oh. The issue we had there is that it didn't create a very round product uh, as well as one that was not very even. Um, and so, <laughs> so it, just, it didn't really hit, hit the mark for us. So instead what we do is we cut about a seven to nine inch portion. It depends on, we weigh it. So it's, it doesn't really matter what the length is. We do a five ounce Got portion it. of dough. Typically they're between anywhere from five to seven inches. And then we shape it to be about five to seven inches. Uh, it can go as long as nine, as I mentioned, but somewhere in there. Uh, and then you start to roll it out, get it to the point where it's almost about a foot. You wrap it around your hand and then you, you do one quick motion like so. And then that is what. Uh, oh, that is, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That we're good. That's the clip right there. That's it's a, slick. That's it's slick. a little more, it's a little more intricate uh, and you don't want to over roll it. That can cause the, yeah. the dough to get a little too hard. Like we mentioned on those bagels that taste like hockey. Bars. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. So that's so what I over roll. Just one quick roll. Um, and, and that is how you do it. I would say it takes about Similar to juggling, you know, if you dedicate one yeah. day of your life to rolling bagels, <laughs> you can roll bagels for the rest of your life. But it's going to take a lot of work in that one day. Sure. To get used to that, you know, to get it all. I get it. But you do it a few times. But that's great, man. That What a great insider tip. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yep. Okay. Didn't, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, no, process. you're good. Okay. So, okay. so now you have about another 24 hours. Your bagels are going to go in the fridge and that's that process of retardation. So that slows down the gluten development in your dough. So if you, if you don't do this, um, your bagels will first overproof because there's yeast in there. It's just going to go crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In addition, uh, your, your glute, it, it won't, it'll kind of overdevelop and get a little too hard as well. So uh, one other thing that allowing putting your bagels in the fridge does, it allows them to withstand the boil, which is the step you do right before they bake. So now we're at about, let's say hour 40 or so. Is in, it because it's changing life. the temperature? Is that why you say that? It cools it? Yeah, cools it down is that, is that, and allows, okay. yeah. Because if it were just say at room temperature or what some places do is they put them in a proofer. Uh, when you do that, they get incredibly soft. And then when you put them in your water that you boil them in, uh, they just spread all around and they can't I, really I see. it. I see. Okay. Yeah, so, that makes sense. So it allows them to uh, just get the toughness to go into the water. Yeah. Uh, and so in hour 40 of the bagel's life, uh, they're going to be boiled. And so the boiling of the bagel is what gives. This is the uh, step here, guys. This right? Is, like this is, this is the for, one that some people one. skip. This is a big step, right? I read about yeah. that. Like people skip this step. This is a big step. And this, this is what makes it. A little bit different from other stuff you know you bake right like it, what what other things are you boiling before yeah, it's borrowed from the pretzel making tradition and that's frankly yeah. the only other product yeah. i know of as yeah. well yeah and yeah. and so the it, it what it helps is get that distinct crust on the exterior layer of your bagel as well as a, a yet another element that adds to that really you know, distinct chew that you get with a bagel comes from, from the boil. So those are the two things that you get with it. During the R&D process, the biggest breakthrough I had was altering our water to make it more basic, like along the pH scale. For ah, about the longest period of time, I felt like I had a B plus bagel. Like friends would, they would like it, but not, they didn't have that love reaction. That, that, that wow before. factor, right? Wow that factor. wow. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And then we altered our bagels to make them the sorry altered our water to make it more basic. And once that happened, that was that was when the shift happened. And that was nice. when I got the wow factor from folks. And that's when I had the confidence to start to think like, hey, maybe this this uh, business idea has some legs. 
Um, and so you, you got to alter your water and, uh, we use sodium hydroxide, also known as lye. It's food safe, all good. Um, you got to you got to handle it with, with care, with gloves and goggles. Sure. But after sure. you do that, uh, and you the water is boiling, it's all good. And that's how we alter our water. It's about we it's about fourteen grams per five thousand grams of water. So it's a trace amount, just yeah. a little bit, gets you what you need. And yeah. and that really small amount um, is what's really key to making the bagel. I'd say that everything is important that was like the one that really elevated wow the bagels wow that is crazy that's cool though that's yep. that's cooking right that's so, baking cooking yeah. science love it and so then the next step you got after your bagels have had their about 30 seconds on each side in their boiling water you take them out and this, this is when you seed this is when you do the double side so you, you want to get like your tray out of your seeds and uh and whatever you're chopping you might be using yeah. say it's your, your sesame seeds get a tray out of sesame seeds one side flip it get it on the other side put it on the tray that you're going to bake it in and then the final step is you bake um bake the bagels and then you take them out and then you got your fresh bagel and that is the that's about the 48 hour life cycle Bam. of a fresh baked bagel so basically once it's in the oven that's like yeah, that's home stretch, right? Yeah. That's coming down third for home plate, really. Yeah. At that at that point, that's the last. You know what it is? It sounds like, excuse me, <coughs> not a COVID cough, uh, guys. Um, it, it sounds like a, just like a. I mean, just to compare, it sounds like you're just doing a quick, you know, fry, if you will, a quick fry, and then in the finish off in the oven, right? It's, it's sort of the same prod, but it's boiling water, right? You're just it, doing it's a, a little quick, bit of a two step. I would yeah. say, and honestly, we use a spider, which uh, which is a cooking device that is yeah. common in frying um, yep. to retrieve our bagels. Yeah, and flip them sure. In there. Scoop them out. So, yeah, yeah. No, it's, I hadn't really thought of the boil in water as, as similar to frying, but in the same way that frying leads to, you know, that nice crunchy exterior. And all the products exactly. Are, yeah, it's, it just gives it that quick exterior. boom, boom you know, and then you finish it off somewhere up right in the oven mm -hmm. or whatever. That's a quick thing, right? When you do a steak, you, you sear it on both sides and get it in the oven, right? It, so it's mm -hmm. probably, do, it's doing something to the outer part of, yep. of that dough to then, so that, you know, bake it. This is something I hadn't like thought so. about, but like, as you mentioned, the sear, you get the Maillard reaction on your steak. Yeah, you, exactly. You know, thinking of uh, bagels with their own Maillard reaction is, is fascinating. I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think right? about that one. Yeah. Hey, bam. See, this is what we do here. We have the, this is what podcasts are for to break this down even more and just spitball. And, you know, I love talking about this stuff, man. This has also been front of mind for me right now uh, because we're looking at a brick and mortar pretty seriously. I'm, I'm knocking on really me. nothing okay. signed, but it's like almost to the signing phase. Um, and it has a drive through component. And, and uh, like yeah. I've been drive through is amazing, but it's a double edged sword because of this exact issue where when folks are in drive through, they're expecting it within five, five minutes is a long wait there. Yeah. And, and what I'm like seriously considering is how do you make high quality food in such a condensed period of time like that? Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I just, it's something I, I don't have the answer to yet. I'm, I'm working on solving it <laughs> pretty, I'll, pretty I'll tell you where but. you go. I mean, look, not to, you know, people have certain feelings about the place I'm going to mention, but whatever they rock drive through, like, like nobody's business. They are the number one drive through the handling of they handle drive through the bet. Chick fil A. Let's be real. They know how to handle drive through like nobody's business. Yeah. Now, how, how and what's I don't know, but there's definitely systems they have that other people don't that they're able to handle the volume like you don't believe. Another place is P. Terry's. They yeah. do a great job with handling volume. Um, you know, I get what you're saying. That, that's what it's about. It's about yeah, it's being able to handle that volume in a, in a great way. Right. And when really the machine's going, you you're rocking you can handle tickets right you're like dude we're we're rolling we yeah. got that momentum you know that that's where it's at so yeah for sure yep so that's uh that's been in front of mind right now is ticket time and how to decrease it and so uh especially because we have up until this point uh our ticket time is you know 24 to 48 hours people place their order for delivery and then we yeah. bring it to their homes and yeah. so it's a whole different ballgame uh, when it's when it's instantaneous. And so sure. um, 
so yeah, that's, that's the next phase. And we'll that's see. awesome. That's awesome, man. Well, wow. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's not this one, I'm sure it, at least it's in your mind. It's something you guys mm -hmm. do want to, uh, expand to. So yeah, I love that. That's, that's so super cool. Are you thinking about making it sort of like the bagel shops you used to walk into in New York? Yeah, precisely. Um, and so kind of walk in, you have that enormous deli counter full of cream cheese, other deli salads, a um, bunch of bagels right behind the counter that you can see, have your eyes into the kitchen, you can see a little bit of the process. Um, that That is the goal for kind of the, the interior front of house space. And then with us being in Texas, want to have a good patio for people that experience their bagels on the outside, or if they're in the grab and go mood, that drive through. So uh, wanted to be the one stop shop for all the bagel needs. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, I'm sure that's going to happen. So I'll, I'll be first in line, man. First in the drive through to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to get something. Well, you know, it sounds like, um, yeah, that sounds awesome, man. You know, I definitely think the process of seeing the bagels be amazing is a big, when it's something interesting, like Mm -hmm. that y'all do and how seriously you take it and the in that you respect it all and everything like that's a that's a cool thing like right like when you go to a place and you see the easy tiger right for instance or when you're in europe man they do that a lot the windows you can see them making the pasta you see the guy doing the thing or whatever it is you, that's what you're you almost go there for that reason alone and like, before right? they before they over expanded crispy cream was always crispy, a, a, yeah. fun, a fun place yeah. to see that you know yeah, it's, we you feel more a part of the process but just by just by seeing it and sure. so so that's yeah. a goal um yeah um, as much as it can be right that, that you can exactly. make that possible yeah yeah for sure no i love that man that's awesome that's so cool. Well, look, is there anything um, we didn't talk about that you wanted to discuss? Uh, I don't, I don't want to miss anything. Uh, I definitely know. want you to plug everything at the yeah. end here. I mean, through the duration of the pandemic, we're offering free home delivery. That's been a big thing for us. Uh, even before the pandemic, we were doing home delivery, but it was at about like, I don't know, one or two a day. And now we're up to, you know, double digits per day. Uh, That's of awesome. home deliveries, which is awesome. And yep. um, just want Austin to know that uh, we can definitely fulfill your bagel needs. Um, you can stay safe while you do it. Uh, and just, just in general, just a quick sidebar, the pandemic's been absolutely bonkers uh, and crazy sure. to be absolutely. operating a business during it. But yep. um, we also, uh, it also kind of forces us to pivot and think about some things. So you can also find our bagels at every Whole Foods in the greater Austin area. Um, Hell yeah. We deliver them fresh daily. So uh, either deliver to your home through rosensbagels.com or you can go to Whole Foods and uh, be on the lookout for a brick and mortar. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I would say my target right now is the spring, which probably means the summer. Um, <laughs> yeah. <some> uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I know how that stuff works for sure. Um, is this is this Austin proper that that all of Rosen's available? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have a pretty broad, we, we deliver to about 20 different uh, coffee shops every day. So, so our delivery drivers are on the road by 5 a.m. We got two of them. And uh, any and plans to go to day. any other cities? Not yet. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, I think that's when a lot of food businesses start to lose their, if not food quality, at least like a little bit of the magic that makes them special is, sure. is when, you, when you start to overexpand. And so I see. at yeah, least I for me, it. that's not the goal uh, in, in starting this business and in making bagels is to just have a bunch of rosins. Um, part of it is like, you know, the, the, or the reason behind the company was to fill an Austin specific need. And so for now, that's, that's my goal. Let me ask you this. What mm -hmm. if you started doing delivery out of Austin? So you're still yeah. making them here. You're still doing that, but maybe delivery. Cause look, we're moving the studio to Dallas in okay. a little, in a little bit, you know, that's why I asked. I'm like, I want to get some Rosen bagel in okay. Dallas. So you the know. solution for that problem, uh, and is another thing that was uh, a pandemic pivot, is we have a product called Frozen's F R O S E N, um, and they uh, well, these bagels follow the exact same process as all of our bagels, with the exception. So after they're boiled and seeded, they don't go in the oven. We put them right in the freezer, and then they're frozen, and then they are ready to be baked at home. And so we've been delivering those and they're also available for delivery. That's now. awesome. So folks can have a fresh bagel whenever they 
they want it. And I think that's going to be the way that we get outside of Austin. Yes, that's a great idea, man. You're involved in the process. It's like a pizza, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to get a frozen pizza yep. and cook it at home. And and what look, people what always, argue, always have one frozen pizza in their freezer it's true. at all times. And what it, and I will vouch for these and say, unlike the pizza or the burrito in your freezer, this actually because we have this isn't something that's been cooked before and then you are reheating it. Yeah, most, I see what most you're saying. Most products are. This has yep, never been yep. made. It's parboiled, not part cooked. And yep. so you are going to get a first never before baked bagel. Out of your home oven. If it's an everything bagel, your whole house is going to smell like an everything bagel. That's oh, great. man. That's a great idea, man. I love that. Well, then that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to be doing is getting that uh, up there. Yeah. And for the people, look, this this podcast is, it, I mean, obviously it goes out everywhere, but it's the Lone Star Plate. So it's all of Texas. So yeah. we want to make sure all Texans uh, can get uh, these bagel. That's a great, I love that, man. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's going to be the way I go for sure. Uh, uh, for the bagels. Uh, are there any good places in Dallas to get a bagel? I guess I'm about to find out. Yeah. Um, admittedly, I don't, I don't know the Dallas bagel scene very well. A few friends who have moved there have lamented it. Um, oh, Houston, really? I yeah, I know Houston has a few local shops that, that are pretty good. Um, but but yeah, that's that's the extent that I Damn. know. The, the broader Dang, Texas right. bagel scene. So well, I think you're going to need some Frozens, my friend. That's it. That's it, brother. Plus, that's way better. I'm at home, right? I can, uh, you know, do it that way. Yeah, that's that's the way to go. Well, man, this is this is. Oh, okay. Before we go here, uh, let's tell people your, you know, website, social media stuff. Yep. You know that that sort of stuff. Let's play. Yeah, all social media handles are at Rosen's Bagel Co. Uh, you can get some fun bagel content every day. We do a fair amount of giveaways too. That's something that's also just in the organizational ethos is wanting to hook our customers up. Um, so so check out at Rosen's Bagel Co. on Instagram uh, and Facebook, and then Rosen'sBagels.com uh, is our website. You can find out more information about our process, the history of the company, and then of course, most importantly. Uh, order your bagels uh, and you can get them delivered to your home um, within 48 hours of your order. So uh, we, we love doing it. And uh, also just it, assuming we got our customers listening. Thank you. Um, like I mentioned, it's been a surreal past 10 or so months and uh, it just to still be operating a business um, would not be possible without the support of the greater Austin community, which has just been uh, fantastic. So thank you. That's awesome, man. No, for sure. Absolutely. Well, listen, man, this has been absolutely uh, great. I really appreciate this, man. This has been awesome. Um, I've learned a lot uh, myself, so I know people are going to learn as well. That's just how that goes. So um, yeah, this has been great, man. I really do appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thank you for coming on and just explaining all this to us. And yeah, please guys check out uh, the website, follow them on social media, get these bagels. If you can't make it, get the frozen ones and boom, you can feel like you're making bagels at home and impress your friends. And, uh, <laughs> right. I love it, man. That's, that's so cool. And you know what we didn't get into, uh, which I'll do in, in the intro later, man, is the history of the bagel. I forgot mm-hmm. to totally bring like, where did bagels come from? Or do you want to tell us real quick? Uh, where, the, where did they come from? There, there's been a book written about the bagel. Uh, what is it? It's a, like a modest history or like a, a surprising history of a modest product. Um, and so its origins are actually a little confused. People believe that it came from Poland, derived from an Italian, uh, kind of mimicking an Italian product, Italian bread product that was also boiled uh, before it was baked. Um, and some think uh, the, the reason why there's a hole, although this is disputed, is because early early uh, peddlers of the bagels would put them on a stick to then just be able to, to hand out. Uh, made its way to America around the 1890s um, through European immigrants and uh, who settled in New York City. Um, strong labor history. Um, the there was a strong bakers uh, bagel bakers union led by bagel owners in New York City during during that time, um, which as as someone who's who's progressive in their politics is means a lot to me. And so uh, sure. so yeah, that uh that's a quick, quick and dirty of it. Yeah. But there's there's a lot there. Um but yeah, check out it's Maria, I'm forgetting her last name. Uh it's a it's a fun, fun book on the history of the bagel. 
Uh, so. No, that's cool. Uh, Cause you know, some, you're right. I mean, one day somebody was like, I, I'm, I'm going to make a bagel. Uh, they didn't call it a bagel, right? The first day they, they're like, let's do, I'm going to do this, that somebody will probably never know, right? The true exact, uh, cause I tried to read online, but you're right. There was a few different stories. Um, so, someone from Vienna supposedly had made it for a king or something. I don't know. Yeah. You know the first, I, but then I read something else, and then you said something, and it's just like, oh man, I don't. Yeah, Mar- Maria suggests Poland, but it could. Yeah, and she she mentions the story too for the the Austrian king. Uh, it's yeah. all. It's all. Who knows? It's cr- you know, it's crazy. Bit, but, yeah. It's more mystery. It's almost better that it stays a little mysterious. You know that that you kind of get to derive your own. Uh, story of the bagel but i love the stick idea that they had it i never heard that they had it on sticks to be able to hand out that makes a lot of sense to be yeah. frank with you that that makes a lot of sense and to be able well i guess not at, before it was cooked they wouldn't have it on the stick that it, i was like oh that's how they would get yeah. them in the oven but i was like oh they'd be drooping that wouldn't make any <laughs> sense right <laughs> Jesus. Uh, but after they're cooked i can totally see them walking down the dirt mud road whatever and handing out uh bagels like that yeah that's uh that's definitely interesting well man definitely uh thank you so much for that quick little (laughs) that's a great way to end it uh for sure so thank you so much tom really appreciate it man uh enjoy the rest of your day and uh yeah man thank you so much for sharing so much about bagels dude this was awesome back at you thank you so much for having me on all right guys what a fabulous interview right with tom unbelievable see bagels guys love them oh so good Okay, so we have our next interview coming up with uh, Min Cho and Angel Sang from So Chinese Delivery and uh, what they're doing to innovate and everything. Yep. But before we get to that, as I said, word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food. All right, guys, as always, it is time for a word from our sponsor, Texas. What about my hand over my mouth? Does that affect the sound? Sorry. It's time for a word from our sponsor. A word from our sponsor. I don't have, we don't have a budget for artists to sing, right? For anybody to sing. So they got me to do it. So it's time for a word from our sponsor. Sponsor. Okay. That was the, the Tay Tay remix. Okay. So our, our, uh, segment today. Okay. The sponsor segment, of course, Texas real food is always texasrealfood.com. It's going to be 10 romantic restaurants to dine in for Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is coming up. Get, you want to get your loved one. If you don't have one, invite somebody. Just go for it, guys. That's my advice. If you're looking for some advice, not, not to interrupt this, but go for it. Ask, you shall receive sometimes. But you don't know if you don't ask. So if you're out there, you're single, you're trying to get a date. Hey, look, it's COVID. COVID dating for Valentine's Day. It's going to be interesting for sure. It's, it's definitely going to be interesting. So, you know go for it that's why i said if you got to do it you know online that can work too maybe get some of this to, uh, to go take out you know do it that way but look if you feel it up for it get out there you know you can still uh get out there and enjoy a romantic uh, restaurant so these are 10 romantic restaurants uh in texas uh to dine in for valentine's day 2021 so okay boom number they're not in any particular order so 10 restaurants in dallas we've got the mansion restaurant yeah that's a nice restaurant okay really really nice turtle creek yeah that's a you know it's american french cuisine elegant european uh setting um and, and by the way this article is on the texas real food site okay so texasrealfood.com slash discover you can find this article all right it's right on the front page there um and yeah look at that Oof. so t- uh, mansion at turtle creek in dallas all right we've also got over easy it's sort of a diner farm to table cafe i guess this could work you know you're trying to do a breakfast brunch lunch sort of deal valentine's day thing that could work okay this is in dallas as well and uh all right in austin we've got the stella uh, san jacinto restaurant or stella san jack restaurant all right um san jacinto because it's on san jacinto boulevard all right so San Jacinto and Fifth. It's a farm-to-table restaurant. It's where, well, uh, upscale American Southern cuisine in a casual environment. Okay, so, ooh. Features morning fare like pecan praline French toast. Ooh, that's delicious. They got a great beverage program. You know, they got all kinds. That looks delicious. Okay, I haven't been there. Beautiful. All right, next one, Trace. Check them out. 
Great patio look in here. Okay, Trace uses fresh ingredients from the region surrounding farms to make flavorful dishes, including an appetizer crab and avocado toast, shrimp and grits, duck chilaquiles, what, and more. What duck chilaquiles? That sounds delicious. So it's situated at uh, the W in Austin. It's awesome. You know, farm to tail. Okay, all this stuff's going to be farm to tail, right? Because it's Texas real food. Okay, we're not going to be sending you guys some bu bullshit. All right, it's on Lavaca Street. Check that out. All right, in San Antonio, got the uh, Meadow Neighborhood Eatery and Bar. Looks delicious. Family-owned restaurants. Been in close partnership with local farms and ranchers. Yeah, this looks great. We're going to... We, we need to go quicker here. All right, Clementine, San Antonio. Uh, it's a family-owned restaurant as well. Uh, huge tables. Open kitchen. Uh, fresh ingredient, seasonal ingredients, of course, like always. Okay, they got like hush puppies, shareable plates, so it's, uh, you know, tapa style. They got oysters, organic salads, ooh, Spanish mackerel, beautiful desserts, it says. So good wine list, beer, great place, check it out. All right, Houston, here we go. Caliente, ooh, madre mía. That just means uh, banana in Spanish. I'm kidding, it means hot. Okay, Caliente is a chef-driven, quick-serve Mexican restaurant serving Tex-Mex recipes made fresh in-house daily bam i want to go to this place i got some great deals too so check this place out in houston it's on sam houston parkway all right here we go uh nobis this is also in houston uh nobis restaurants committing to sourcing ingredients from local farms as always gulf coast seafood okay houston's right by the coast there um look they, they value themselves in transparency and honesty in cooking food okay I love this place already. Constantly changing menu. Why? Because just what's available. So great place. Check it out. It looks like they got a great happy hour. They got bread, pasta, seafood, steaks. Okay. Wines, beer, cider. Great place. All right. And they got that uh, reverse happy hour stuff going on too. So, okay. Fort Worth. Here we go. Ooh, I don't know how to say this. E-L-L-E-R-B-E. -L -L -E -E. So... Uh, L or B, Fine Foods, or A, I don't know. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop. L or B, Fine Foods in Fort Worth. Uh, elegant, innovative farm to table. Cuisine highlighting the freshest local ingredients. Oof, this is great, guys. Check that out. Cafe Modern in Fort Worth, another place. Boom. Oh, that's in Fort Worth. Great, great place. So there you go, guys. Some places. If you, you know, check out your own, whatever. Look, remember, put in your zip code. Find a place around you if none of those were, were near you. So thank you as always. Please check out TexasRealFood.com. Love you. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. Back to the show. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> All right, guys. Woo! Yes, Texas Real Food. I'm telling you guys, check it out, texasrealfood.com. I'm just going to keep repeating that. Okay, last interview of the uh, podcast here with uh, So Chinese Delivery. Again, such, this is so good. And again, th these are both going up unedited on our YouTube channel. So don't forget the Lone Star Plate. All right, let's get to it, guys. Min Cho, Angel Sang, So Chinese Delivery. Enjoy. Excited to have y'all. Ready to talk some food? Yeah, thanks for having us, man. Appreciate sure. it. Absolutely, of course. Uh, well, why don't y'all introduce uh, yourselves, and we'll we'll go from there. Sure. Um, my name is Min Cho. I am the co-founder and CEO of So Chinese Delivery. Um, I've been here in Austin for about 36 years and counting, and uh, we're really excited to introduce a new generation of Chinese food delivery, not only to Austin, but all of, all of Texas and all of America eventually. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> My name's Angel Sang. I'm the CTO and co-founder of So Chinese Delivery. A uh, long history in tech startups, uh, and this is my first foray into, into the food industry, so it's pretty interesting. <laughs> For sure. Food is a, is a different animal, no pun intended, right? It's, it really is. Yeah. Uh, well, awesome, guys. Well, thank you all so much, uh, you know, for joining us today. I do have some questions and hopefully we can just look. This is 
I don't really do interviews. I always say that on the podcast. We just have conversations. So we're just going to, uh, you know, relax and, and talk a little bit and and uh, hopefully give the listeners something uh, uh, worth listening to. Right. Like, like that's that's really all it is. First of all, let's start with the correct. You said it, uh, the correct pronunciation of the business, because I'm sure people mispronounce it like crazy all the time. Right. That's like a common <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah, you, know, you know, we get Tiso a lot and <laughs> Cal a lot. Uh, we, we say so, um, which is it pays homage to General So Chicken uh, or General So in general. Um, you know, he's a strong character in the, you know, in the history. He's a real person. Um, and, you know, the number one Chinese food uh, entree or dish out there is General So Chicken. And so it's yeah. a little homage to him and to the to the cuisine and to that particular uh entree because that's like a, a crazy story right of like how that dish got started and it's not even really chinese right i mean i mean it was created i i mean do you know the story you i mean yeah yeah you're kind of shaking your head you tell us you tell it there's a lot of uh myths urban myths out there about uh, about this particular dish I'll let Angel take this one. He's uh, he's well in depth uh, with knowledge. <laughs> of the history I mean, of um, in Chinese food. If you want to talk about Chinese food in general, uh, in the majority of the dishes that you see in Chinese food today were invented here in the United States: um, cashew chicken, um, orange chicken. Um, with, with General So, you can trace its roots all the way back to Taiwan. Um, that's where it really started um, uh, with a chef uh, named C.K. Peng. And uh, I think, I believe it was in the 70s. Is that right, man? Um, when it came to New York? Yeah, yeah. He eventually took it to New York City, or some of his, uh, it became very popular in Taiwan. And some of the chefs in Taiwan took it to New York City. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, unbeknownst to him. <laughs> oh, okay. So he, he was still back in Taiwan and some it was, other chefs. It was pop yeah, it was popularized in Taiwan. I, I see. No. I see. Uh, Interesting. Uh, that, that sweet, sticky, uh, orange, uh, acidic sauce is kind of like a Taiwanese thing. Um, okay. And it was, it mutated over time. It transformed over time. But, you know, when, when other chefs loved it and eventually brought it into New York City, they popularized it in New York City, uh, unbeknownst to Jeff C.K. Peng. Sorry, and my dog's it, here. <laughs> and then it spread like wildfire, uh, you know, through yeah. the 70s, 80s. And then, yeah. um, you know, along that Around that time, like other similar dishes like sesame chicken, orange chicken, those yeah. were invented in New York City as well. Wow. Wow. And That's crazy. Yeah. So, that, <laughs> so if somebody that that is kind of crazy, it, it, how close is it to, to what's out right now? How close is it to what was in this in New York City in the 70s or has it transformed from even then to now? Well, I think. Um, you know, when, we, when you're discussing Chinese food, oftentimes if you're talking to an American, they're thinking about it in the lens of Chinese American. Yeah, uh, that's true. The American view. So like, um, like I said, the, a lot of dishes were invented in America. So it couldn't, like Chinese food, according to Americans, couldn't be more American. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's deeply embedded into the culture of America. Sure. But that being said, um, Chinese food takes different shapes and forms all over the world. Uh, for example, if you ever talk to someone from Peru, um, actually a lot of Peruvian dishes are heavily, heavily influenced by, by Chinese food. And so uh, there's a very, very strong Peruvian Chinese scene. Um, I would say that the British Chinese scene is heavily influenced by Hong Kong. And you if you go to, if you go to UK, uh, there's a lot of dishes that are totally different there. Yeah. 100%. And so, and so, yeah, the, 
the, the translation from Taiwan to New York City, I think originally it didn't have broccoli because broccoli, American broccoli is not typically eaten in Asia. Um, but then American broccoli was added because that's it was, what the produce it was here the available produce yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean that yeah that's pretty much what chinese food is 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 like the story of um immigrants coming to america wanting that familiarity of what they remembered but then only having access to the ingredients that you have in the groceries the local grocers so that seems like a, a story from you know a lot of immigrant right cultures um whatever type of food it may be right they're, they're trying to bring something familiar but they've got to look around at what they have and sort of make it work and yeah. then bam you've got this fusion of, of sorts something new uh, that's that's cool it's a that's beautiful cool. story of the roots of you know immigrants in america sure um and it's a story of survival in some ways, right? To 100%. try and make it, 100%. You know, um, and keep a piece of home with you because food is home, right? Right. Yeah. That's important. I don't think kids are learning the recipes from grandma and from aunt, whoever, and right. And uncle this and right. Like you've yeah. got to learn those recipes as well. I think it's important that gets lost. Yeah. One of my bucket lists to do is like travel the world and eat Chinese food from different countries. Love that. I yeah, would love to like, do that with, with Mexican food too. Yeah. There's, there's a really strong Indian Chinese, uh, sure. cuisine like it, here in Austin, there's a, there's a restaurant called Masala Wok, which is basically, Ooh, I never heard of that Indian Chinese food for Americans. So it's like a three way culture thing where it's yeah. Chinese food that transformed in India. And then they took that and put it in America. Uh, <laughs> and there's I'm some on, on. wonderful wonderful ch korean chinese dishes out there that it's chinese food that that's mutated in korea and they're not yeah. korean but they originated from china they're they're, they're delicious yeah I'm, I'm all about that i'm all about the mixing of different foods i know that's some, sort of a current topic actually right now and there was actually an article that came out about appropriating food right appropriating food from another culture and uh -huh staying in your lane, if you will. Um, and and I, I think there's, I'd be curious, you know, to hear y'all's opinion on this uh, because, you know, I have a lot of friends who are chefs and from different backgrounds, Indian, Korean, Mexican, um, you know, American, right? Just, just whatever. Everybody honestly says the same thing. Like, dude, people just cook what you want. Just, just make what, what food you want. You know, if it tastes good, that that's what it is. It, respecting what you're taking is, you know, the key to any good chef that, that has nothing to do with the food. It's, it's the person handling it, right. And just respecting what it is, but making some changes, nothing wrong with that. And maybe it's not exactly the way the dish was. So now you're appropriating it, but just like we talked about, sometimes the ingredients just aren't available and you've got to, make a switch here or there to substitute and just be creative, whatever happened to just being um, creative. So I think more chefs need to speak out on this and start telling people, I don't know, that's my opinion. Of course, every chef can have their own opinion and in, in person, but I, I'm curious, what, what do y'all think about that? You know, s cooking like that. Well, I'm not a chef, but <clears throat> you know, I've lived in Austin for a long time and we I'm Korean American but we've been cooking Chinese food for going on 16 years now. And, you know, first of all, I don't know when cultural appropriation became a bad word. I, like, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't understand why it conveys negativity. Yeah. You know, we travel the world because we want to learn about other cultures and, and, you know, appreciate cuisine is usually at the top of that list because cuisine is usually the, way you, you know, learn and uh, appreciate other cultures. You know, one of the things that we like to say is that, yes, most of the food that we, uh, we, we sell um, is Chinese American and it's quote unquote Americanized, but there is, isn't really anything inauthentic about that. In fact, we like to say that we are authentically Chinese American. And so really it's, it's a blending of various cultures and, you know, foods that may have came, come from Arizona or the West Coast or the Northeast, New England, 
wherever, and then you make it as good as you possibly can. And, you know, even here in Austin, our general so chicken is going to be different from, you know, Wu Chow's general so chicken or, 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 you know, Din Ho's general so chicken or any other general so chicken here in Austin. There are, diff- there are varieties of general so chicken. And I don't think there's any one person that can say what is right or what's wrong. You're just going to have a preference. And, you know, I happen to love our general so chicken and that's the way it is, right? <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing inauthentic about saying, you know, yeah, we've evolved our food to not only is it the country that we live in or the city we live in or the neighborhood we live in, but you also have to consider the time that we live in too. And, you know, things evolve for a reason. And so uh, we're very proud of our food. Uh, We like to think we do things the right way with our food, you know, and so, um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Angel, any comments on, on that particular topic? Yeah, I mean, we're kind of. I'm kind of sick of the whole foodie snobby. Uh, thank you, thank you for saying it. Authentic. Uh, yes, thank you for saying it. Way of like, well, I can't eat that because it's not authentic, and and to me, that is a very close-minded way of looking at things. I think it's not an either-or uh, proposition. You know, I think there's a place. I love. Um, like traditional mainland China, Chinese dishes that you otherwise find difficult to find here in Austin. Um, I absolutely love it, but there's a place in my heart also for, you know, uh, chicken lo mein (laughs) or a veggie egg roll or a a crab rangoon. And um, I can love both. And like, yeah, I think there's far too much polarization when it comes to like types of cuisines and yeah. I, I think that you could we, we could all be a little bit more open-minded about um americanized food i guess in in some ways uh i think it, Amer- americanized food get kind of gets bad rap it's got a negative connotation to it oh, because sure. it's inauthentic but i think we need to embrace our american heritage uh you know like chinese the chinese uh culture has been around since the mid 1800s in in america and so this is a you know like when you're eating chinese food that stands for a legacy of at least 170 years of of um restaurateurs and entrepreneurs yeah that's what that story stands for when you eat chinese food uh, and so when you when you embrace or understand the history of where this comes from, then it gives you so much more meaning. Uh, and it's more than just Panda Express airport food, right? It, it actually comes from a really, really long history. And once you appreciate that, I think it actually ends up tasting better. Wow. That's great. I love that. Yeah. Great. But great. I, I agree with both of y'all. Um, y'all make some really great points. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, wow. Yeah. I'm glad we're talking about this because again, it's, it's something that's sort of creeping out into the world and it's li- it's, li- it limits food. It limits restaurant tours. It limits chefs. It limits it just nothing but limits and closes doors that you could otherwise go through. And, um, you know, you never know what the next chef is le- going to create. And if we're telling them, well, you can't do this, this, and this, and this. And if you do do this, you have to do it this way and only this way. And that's it. And let's say for someone who is an immigrant who's here, who they're like, nope, you can only cook immigrant food. You know, you can only get cook your food from your country traditionally. That's it. Don't do, don't, don't step out and cook something else that you liked and wanted to fuse with your dish. And, you know, I, again, it just for me comes down to limiting and, and taking away from the history. Right. And learning about that. And, and like you guys said, it is about traveling around and learning these things. We do travel to go eat in other places. And America is actually a great place to get food from, you know, try some other, cult, you know, food from other cultures. And you can get pretty close to traditional and then up and down the ladder from there. And like you said, it all has its own place. And, uh you know, as long as they're respecting the food and serving you something good, I, I, it's for me, it's, I, I don't really care what, what you're doing. I, I don't think there's any, 
appropriation, um, you know, happening there. Uh, you know, what's opinion. really interesting is that right now in China, there's a big craze for Americanized Chinese food because it's not, it's not it's found not there. in their regular yeah, restaurant. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So it's like, new, they're like, right? oh my God, what is this amazing <laughs> food? <laughs> this is so much better than what we're eating every day. <laughs> I so, love that. That's good. Yeah, so, I mean, they don't, they don't have that built-in bias, right? Yeah. They, they, they didn't, they weren't trained to hate it. Sure. And so for them, it's new. And if it's new, but it's delicious, who cares? You know, like there's- Who cares? Exactly. Yeah. It, it's delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's delicious. Hello, we should stop there. It's delicious. End of conversation. Yeah. Why are we even? Yeah, that's that is just. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, definitely blows my mind uh, as far as that goes. But yeah, I'm glad you got I'm glad we're talking about this again, because it's something that's that's come up and I just don't understand it. You know, yeah, it's not authentic. I can't eat this. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I slap people when they say that. Like, what are you talking about? We, first of all, what is authentic? What does that even mean? You don't <laughs> even know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not out there. It, it can never be authentic. We are here on this particular, <laughs> you know, block. Like, there's no way to get the same anything. So, of course, it's, uh, you know, going to be a little bit different. But yeah, no, I, no. I think what is I think what authenticity really is for food or where does where authenticity has its place is in the love of making that food right yeah, like, exactly i think i think you can judge food by its intention so yeah, if the intention exactly. is to just make a ton of money then yeah i think we can judge food by that sure. versus people who are actually who actually care about the the craft of, yep. of food, who care about um, sustainability, uh, who care about your customer, the customer's experience, who care about, you know, like um, the ingredients, the sourcing of the ingredients. Yeah. Um, that That's where the love is. And to me, that's where the authenticity, that's where authenticity has its place. Absolutely. Um, respecting, respecting, you know, the process and what's going on, right? It's exactly. Just yeah that's it yeah absolutely you know it is funny when you know if you're out of america right and feel oh american food sucks right you hear the oh you guys eat like shit in america they eat shitty food in america right it's it's well what is american food right what does that mean it's like saying what does an american look like i mean hello it's 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 become something you can't just put in a box i mean what's american food there's so much what what history what what are we getting into what are we talking about yeah guess what hot dogs are german and pizza is italian yeah pizza <laughs> yeah, yeah hamburgers yeah. are from ham hamburg so you know uh do you want to talk about native american uh diets because at that point <laughs> it's it's exactly. a silly conversation right it, it it is it's it's silly it's it it doesn't make any sense and it's the same for any country you're in if you're trying to define it into one thing it doesn't matter what country it is, you can't it, there's so much more to you know what what it is and 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 just particularly how different people eat right it's like uh we're not all the same so it's it's you know you can't stay it's you just can't get it stamped that way so yeah but i'm glad you guys are out here uh you know, doing this, representing, um, serving good food. You know, the reviews are amazing. You guys have online for real. Like the, the, the love is out there, man. You guys are doing phenomenal stuff. The, the pictures are like just mouthwatering to be frankly, you know, to be frank with you. Um, that's great. You know, you, you guys are, and what, something I noticed is that it's more delivery focused, right. Than having, which, which is, you know, People, I guess, you know, I'm going to talk pre-pandemic here. Pre-pandemic, that wasn't necessarily a focus for everybody. Delivery was, we'll do it because people are doing it. And, and, and these customers want that convenience of these certain apps. So let's, you know, have 17 tablets on the counter now to, you know, for every freaking app thing that there is. And, but now that the pandemic is hit, I can definitely see people changing course maybe a little bit more. But you guys, before the, you know that's happening, y'all's focus is delivery and and staying in that. I'm curious why 
And yeah, we'll just kind of go from there and see what, what happens. Um, you know, I, I think my introduction into the restaurant world was, you know, back in 06 or 07. And uh, we sort of accidentally stumbled into it. Um, you know, my wife, we didn't, it was pre-kids. My wife didn't have a whole lot to do at the time. And um, we decided to open up a Chinese restaurant in our neighborhood. And, you know, I had been involved in other businesses at the time, but there's something extremely rewarding about feeding people. And, you know, when you sell food and people come back and tell you how much they enjoyed it, or you see repeat customers, uh, it's very fulfilling and it's rewarding. Right. Um, and so over the years we had done multiple concepts. I fell in love with the restaurant business as an entrepreneur. And I just, I knew that there was a future in the restaurant world for me and my wife and our family. Well, what I also discovered during the process is that the restaurant industry is, it's fucked up. <laughs> it's, there's so many inefficiencies yeah. and there are so many bottlenecks and um, there are just lots of problems. And we, at this point we had become quote unquote experts in the Chinese food industry. And so we knew how to cook the food, um, but we were slaves to the, to the industry norms so, you know, uh, there's a bad stigma that comes around with Chinese food, you know, greasy hangover food. And we're like, why, why do we have to fall into that trap? Um, there was a problem with the, the staffing of the service industry. Um, the outrageous rents of these huge buildings, restaurants in general, you know, they're spending 70 to 80% of their rent expense on dining space that only gets utilized pre pandemic only gets utilized 20 or 30% of the time. So the math just doesn't make sense there. Like, why are you spending so much money on in these areas that heavily impact your bottom line? You know, your average successful restaurant is going to make 10% profits. So for every hundred dollars they sell, they're hoping to make 10 bucks. If, right? if That's that, right. Good, if, if that, that. <laughs> if that and I said, and yeah, and I preface that by saying, your average successful restaurant, yeah. that, right? <laughs> I always say breaking um, even in the restaurant industry is, is a success. I know, yeah. And so there's something wrong with the industry in that sense. And we were fortunate that our experience was in the Chinese food world. Um, and what I mean by that is we know, you know, Chinese food is already extremely, extremely popular in America. Over 80% of Americans have had Chinese food. And yet wow. over 80% of the Chinese food restaurants in the country are mom and pops, right? So they're, you know, Miss, Miss Angie Lee with her husband who has a small corner Hunan something, right? That just feeds their little neighborhood. And the only reason why they have that restaurant is because they have children and they're trying to put those kids to school so that they become successful lawyers or attorneys or whatever it is, they're not looking to hand these restaurants down to their kiddos. Well, there's no, no one doing fast food, like in a enterprise sort of, uh, sort of, you know, this business solution. Yes. Panda Express had come around at this point, which is doing extremely well, whether you like their food or not, they are oh, yeah. in a massively successful company. Yeah. Um, and they do a lot of good to, to the country. They give back crazy amounts of money and things like that. Oh, that's great. But anyway, we realized that, you know, I had sort of this, it, I wouldn't even call it an epiphany, just a new realization why, you know, Chinese food is synonymous with takeout. You know, back in yeah. the day, if you said the word delivery, it was pizza. With the little the boxes, takeout. right? Like yeah. the, 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 yeah, totally. Exactly. You got the little pagoda pale rice pail boxes and things like yeah. that. And so, and anytime you watch the movie or yeah, exactly. drama, they're always eating yeah. Chinese food out of those <laughs> Yeah, things. I mean, totally. yeah. Dude, just a little quick history lesson. That, that pail, that box, that was invented in Chicago. <laughs> I love it. I love it. In Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was, it's an oyster pail. <laughs> that is hilarious. That is funny. And so eventually we were like, why are we not doing 
what Domino's and Papa John's and Pizza Hut have done with pizza. Why are we not, why is no one doing that with Chinese food? And so we did our research and we're like trying to figure out why isn't anyone doing it? There must be something wrong with this process, except that we found out it's not because that there's anything wrong. It's just because there's not a lot of people who, one, know Chinese food that well, right? Because again, it's mostly immigrant mom and pops. Yeah. Right? And, and then two, it's just no one's trying to build a big business with the Chinese food industry. They're just getting by so that their kids can go off to college. Well, you know. Yeah, you're saying like they're not trying to grow up past the one spot they have, right? They're not thinking about what, you know, X growth and, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, I see yeah. what you're saying. Now, Pan Express's story is a little bit different because a lot sure. of their success started off with airports and, and like the super food. Uh, oh, okay. The food stand, scoop and, and put on your plate. So their story is a little bit different. They took a different lane. Um, and then for us, we were like, yeah, we cook fresh food. We package it. We do a ton of delivery with our Chinese food. But if we want this to become the dominoes of Chinese food, which was sort of our, uh, it was sort of our motto. It was like, hey, we need to become the dominoes of Chinese food, right? Um, we realized that in order to do that, especially in this day and age, we needed really good technology and software. And that's when I reached out to Angel and I was like, Hey, I have a stupid idea, but I need you to listen to me for a second. And then Angel was like, yeah, it's a pretty stupid idea. But let's do it. <laughs> like, like Chinese food, really, of all things, Chinese food. And then we talked about numbers and cents and, and the software. And, and then things were just starting to come together. So, and that's when, you know, things took off and uh, we built the software for a year and a half before we opened our store. Wow. Holy cow. Wow. That's a, that's a, I didn't know that. Okay. That's crazy. So y'all developed your own system for the, for delivery, for the orders, you know, ordering system with the customer, every, right. That whole interface, everything. Wow. That is, that's amazing. We're probably the only Chinese restaurant in the world who started with code first. Um, <laughs> I love I mean, that. Yeah, we, this is a new story. I got to say, we this literally is wrote our entire code base ourselves. We're not dependent on Shopify or or WordPress, WooCommerce or any of those wow. Squarespace like cuz all of those are like e-commerce based systems designed to like ship you a UPS or FedEx package. Yeah. Right? Yeah. None of them actually addressed on-demand delivery. Um, I guess technically Uber Eats and DoorDash are that e-commerce front for, for restaurants. But back in 2016, when we had this idea, it wasn't quite as popular and, you know, like the, there was no infrastructure around. So we looked around, looked around even more and just couldn't find anything. So we were like, you know what, we're going to have to build this ourselves. So by the way, yeah. just quick insert, this is where, this is where Angel told me initially our budget for software was 30 grand. And when he couldn't find something over the, over the counter, it turned into 300 grand. I was like, <laughs> I just, I oh, remember man. Very uh, we spent more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, long-term go, you know, structure of this and, and owning it all and not having to pay out some other, 30% right to this other company or 33%, whatever it's jumping up to now, that is that money essentially. Um, right. I mean, in the long-term goal, you're probably going to spend that on whatever fees. Yeah. We're, we're trying to be as vertically integrated as possible, which yeah, means like yeah. your entire workflow, right. From collecting orders online to actually fulfilling orders all the way to the customer's doorstep. We are trying to own every piece of that so that we don't have to shell out commission and subscription fees to this and that. You know, like most restaurateurs just don't have the technical skill to be able to manage a software team. Of course develop not. That's, that's not, you don't get into the yeah. restaurant business to manage a software team. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, exactly. <laughs> and, and then most, most software companies like DoorDash and Uber Eats, they don't deal with the food. Exactly. Obviously, they, don't, they don't want to deal with that kind of nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess in some ways we're dealing with three nightmares, right? 
which is software platform, actually making food mm -hmm. and then delivering it. And so delivering it's, it. It's really three, yeah. three nightmares. And that's and a good so, point. So it's a combination of luck and luck and skill experience of like putting those three disciplines together um, yep. all into one seamless platform. So it's just, we own the whole step. And a lot of times uh, we'll run into problems, but because we own the software, because we wrote the code, we just go and fix it. it. Yeah, totally. Uh, as 100%. opposed to being a, you know, uh, in, imprisoned by your your relationship with the POS system or your relationship with Uber Eats and DoorDash, which a lot of restaurants would admit it's somewhat um, toxic. Um, and so, predatory. yeah, exactly. The predatory is absolutely, oh, we talk about, I've done a whole podcast episode about <laughs> them. Okay. Like for real. To, hey to Patrick, can we, uh, you know, Angel was talking about our cars. Can we talk cars for a second? Yeah, man. And you're getting the inside scoop. This is a news flash. We have yet to announce this publicly. Woo! Here we it's go. happening right now. I love it. <laughs> uh, we are currently piloting a program um, where we're getting rid of gas combustion vehicle, I, you know, ice vehicles with Teslas. Yeah. Whoa, uh, that is sick. Oh, but I think shit. it's important that we kind of talk and explain it because I think the knee jerk reaction would be, you know, from customers like, what the fuck? They're, they're buying Teslas to deliver <laughs> our food. They better discount my food some yeah. more, right? That's going to be the knee jerk reaction. And so it's like, but we need to explain that, you know, and Angel's been really the person spearheading this, this move for us. Uh, we're both huge Tesla aficionados and like obsessed with Tesla in general, but um, love my Tesla stock. It's made me so much money recently. <laughs> right. You have no idea. I had the best Christmas. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're all here too. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Uncle <Great>. Elon. <laughs> yeah. Uncle Elon. <laughs> Actually oh. funny story. We were just, uh, Angel was just communicating with our sales. We just purchased our second Tesla as part of the pilot program, like literally today. And uh, that's awesome. We were just joking around with a salesperson. Um, and she said that she personally spoke with Elon Musk, who, you know, moved here to Austin recently. Yeah. And he told her that he loves our crab rangoons. <laughs> and so we were like, yeah, we need to trade oh, I, Crab Rangoons for some Tesla Model 3s. <laughs> dude, you know what? That Can you imagine? He would share that y'all are, your delivery service is all Teslas. Is he not going to market that? Is he not going to like blow that up? I mean, and it's in Austin and it's, I mean, it's just no way. That's smart, man, guys. Woo. We have a sort of a game plan. So we're piloting the program. We're going to get them wrapped and all that stuff. And then, uh, we're going to see if we can't hire Elon to do a delivery for us. <laughs> oh, my dude, that would be so sick. Yeah. I mean, so I, that is so sick. Min, Min had a point, which was to dispel this, like, impression that we're wasting money. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, again, just like we did with starting the business, first we do some math, right? And the math yeah. is... We're driving around 100 to 150 miles a day per vehicle. Um, and we roughly have like eight, eight vehicles per store. Um, so like uh, we're spending a lot of money on fuel, on gasoline. Sure. And so we did the calculation. And, and oil changes, oil right? all, changes that, all that stuff. Transmission yeah. fluid. Yeah, transmission. Um, and uh, it's, oh, and not only that, it costs us labor costs to go and fuel up. Like, we don't literally have a gas station at our yeah. store. <laughs> so it it's something like 15 minute to 20 minute round trip yeah. to just go fill up the, the car. And we do that almost every day. Um, so we've got a huge, huge spreadsheet. It's like 20 tabs um, <laughs> doing all these calculations on our, 
you know, uh, our costs. And we pitted it against the Model 3 and we're going to save $3,000 annually per vehicle just on the fuel. Give me a break, right? And so, and then not only that, the resale value of an electric vehicle is much, much higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than our um, our Priuses and our Corollas that we're using yeah. today. Um, and by the way, these are, this is math put against hybrids, not just like a normal gas guzzler. These are... 45 mile per hour, mile per gallon vehicles so it's tough competition wow. sure but like electricity rates are 10 cents a kilowatt so like it just it's still saving us tons and tons of money um so at the end of the day we're not actually spending more we're spending way less on the total operations um using model threes yeah, um, you know, but the benefit is it looks like you're spending more. That's even better. That's like, right? It, it just the production value, as we'd say in film, right? Like it, it just it, it just gives it way more production value at the same time. Plus, people are like, oh damn, is that a Tesla? Oh shit, that's cool. I mean, that's just the first reaction people are going to have as well that you're not going to get from oh shit is that a prius no one's ever said that i don't <laughs> think in the history <laughs> of cars right oh, at least what the drivers think too like, yeah you're right like, oh i get to cruise around in a tesla 100 <laughs> percent. come be a driver with us you get to cruise exactly you get to cruise around in a tesla i mean absolutely put your instagram game Right, all that goes up, all that stuff. It, it, it really is a domino effect in, in a lot of ways. Uh, oh, it's really smart. Look, look let, let me say this and for the people listening, for anyone thinking, oh, gosh, they're going to get Teslas. They're spending money. They got money to burn, so they should lower their prices. Listen, y'all, think about everything they've said during this podcast. Th think about it. They think about everything. Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rub y'all's backs here. Y'all are, this is what I love about y'all. Y'all are thinking about this stuff you're taking the time you think you're taking the effort you care you respect it you, you know you want to invest in people that are thinking like y'all right you want to go eat and support at a, a place like this because they care guys that you're giving them money that they're going to invest well look at the money you spend at their place look what they do with it look what they turn around and do with that money i think that's impressive and i think that's something that a lot of business owners do not do which is respect the money coming in and that's, I, I, you know, so for y'all, you know, maybe having that issue or if people are going to have, you know, that issue on the front end, that that's, that's my response to them. Um, and especially just from what I've heard from y'all, you know, you guys care about this business. You're trying to grow it and stay in business, right? You can become a fan and not worry about, well, they'll be gone in six months. You know, you, you can worry about investing in y'all and, and, you know, because of what y'all are thinking about and being on the cutting edge of things, to be frank with you, you're almost ahead of the curve a little bit every time and, you know, making moves that you're going to see other people making years down the road, which is, which is great. So. Yeah. We're trying to be, sense. we're trying to be considerate. Um, yeah. We're trying to be, you know, like goes. as we're trying to hustle, right? Like yeah. that's, that's what, that's what entrepreneurs do is we hustle and, putting together a crazy 20 tab spreadsheet to do calculations on vehicle expenses is, is our example of hustling. Um, there's tons of non quantitative benefits here. And I want to highlight the fact that in January, January 1st, we became, we converted from like just a normal LLC into last, last, last year. We converted into a uh, a B Corp, a benefit corp, which is similar to a C Corp, except a B Corp, a benefit corp, uh, allows us to put into our mission statement as a company of how we're going to benefit, uh, you know, society or the community. Um, and that's uh, that plays out in, you know, more compostable sustainable um, sources of ingredients as, as well as our, our packaging. That's awesome. But the, the move from gas guzzler to electric vehicles is in the same vein. It, it's part yeah. of our mission statement, which is sure. um, we want to, 
you know, reduce our carbon footprint. Awesome. Um, so we care about that too. So there's That's so great. many pros. It's like, it's just, it's like, what do you do? What do you do here? Y'all are firing on all cylinders here. Well, so. you know, thanks Patrick. We, I, I can't say how much we appreciate, you know, you sharing our story. That's all part of the, part of the journey too, is, you know, sharing the story, being a part of the growth and, you know, you add another page into a chapter of this book that we were trying to write um, about how not only can we make a thriving, profitable business, but a business that does the right thing, does it the right way. You know, when did that become, <laughs> you know, strange, right? And so, uh, You're so uh, extreme. I don't know. That's, that's, that's extreme. Yeah. So, you know, we're having fun doing it. We work hard but we love it. We have, we do it with a lot of passion and I'm mostly excited that the people that, you know, work with us as a team, as a family at, at so, or for, you know, for the most part, anyway, they, they seem to enjoy working with us too. So um, yeah, we're going to continue to rock and roll, man. That's so awesome. Yeah. We'll be looking out for these Teslas y'all, you know, that's yeah. what that's, that's just exciting. I would, I, you know, makes me just want to order food just to see the Tesla roll up to my house. To be frank with you, like, especially if Al, well, you probably gonna have to tell the drivers, listen, guys, none of this auto driving, right. None of the, those features, you might have to disable, disable that shit. Cause I can see them, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I've never actually even been in a Tesla, so I don't know how, like, how does that even feel? The auto feature. I've never even been in a car that's done it. I don't know how, how even far advanced the Teslas are, um, you know, as far yeah, as you, goes, you can, but. you can control the speed. Uh, you can, rem you can disable the autopilot stuff, but I mean, like, we're not worried about that because like, if we have a driver that's got a problem, you know, You'll know it. If you have a problem yeah. driver, then that, sure. the problem is really with us because we hired them. Yeah. Wow. Look at you and taking responsibility. <laughs> that's how you do it. That's right. I mean, that's I where it starts, you. right? You, I agree. You, I agree. You hire the right people. You set the right culture. And then you trust people as adults to do their job. I mean, the reason why they're paid the way they're paid is because we don't have to you we don't have to use a tip to incentivize great service. Sure. They provide yeah. great service because they're great people and we yeah. only have great people. And those great people will be okay. entrusted with our, our, our Teslas just as they've been entrusted with our Toyota Priuses <laughs> up until <laughs> this point. Hey, and they're entrusted with the food, getting the food to that yeah, person. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's exactly. a big deal. That's a big deal. Well, is there anything we didn't mention real quick? Well, well, uh, obviously, you know, you guys will give your social media and website and all that stuff and how people can order and whatever. But anything real quick that y'all that I didn't mention that y'all wanted to quickly throw out? Uh, yeah, you know, we've got the two locations. Uh, 38th and 935 is our Cherrywood location. We have the Arbor location at 183 in Mopac. Uh, coming, our expected opening for our South Congress and Old Torf is in April. Nice. And then we should have a Cedar Park location, I believe, in June or July. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. What about uh, social media handles, website? What's a, what, yeah. Give us a lowdown here. SoDelivery.com is where you place the order. Um, we're on all the social media tags of so Delivery, typically at so Delivery. Um, yeah. And send us a message. You know, we respond to every email that comes in. Um, and we have dedicated people that are, you know, their specific role is to respond to customers and to provide service and support. So um, reach out to us with ideas, suggestions. We love it. Uh, literally, we respond to everything. So um, reach out. Yeah. And awesome. thank you. Thank you, everyone, for continuing to support us and being a part of the journey as well. Absolutely. Angel, any, any last words here? That sounded dark. I didn't mean it like that. That's <laughs> before you die. Yeah. Before you die. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep it real guys. And you know, like <laughs> want to reach out to us, 
We're real human beings. We're not like a giant faceless company. We're, we're Austinites just like everyone else. Uh, and uh, just come try our Chinese food. Boom. That's it. That's it. There's nothing more to it. That's it. Come try the food. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome guys. Well, this has been amazing. Like I said, uh, thank y'all so much for your time today. Um, yeah. We'll send out an email when this uh, goes out. It'll probably be, could come out next week. That is possible, but more than likely it will be the week just right after that. Where do you uh, live so at? I live in Austin and South Austin off of South Congress and Ben White, basically. That's basically okay. where I'm at. I'm at Battle Ben Park. You'll be yeah. just down the street from the new location then. I'm moving though. I'm moving to uh, Dallas actually in February. I'm taking the so, studio. We're we're taking the studio up to Dallas. Oh nice. So that's our next market is Dallas. So well, I will be there. There is no question yeah. about that. Uh you know, the, the podcast is all Texas, right? So we we gotta start promoting uh, some other yeah. other stuff. In fact, I haven't even mentioned that on the podcast. You guys, y'all, y'all got me to just uh, release <laughs> some new information that has not been said yet. Uh, so yes, that is happening. I'm we're moving the podcast to Dallas. Uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll go more into on a separate intro of that. But there's uh, yeah, that's some new. Uh, I have one last question for you. And then yeah, I can call it quits for myself. Yeah, yeah, of course. What's your favorite Chinese dish? Ooh, I love uh, this dish. I always, I don't know if it's called this anywhere else, but I used to go to this place in, in Dallas, actually, uh, called Empress of China. They've been around for like 25 years. We know the family. I always got this dish called Princess Beef. It was like Mongolian beef fish, uh-huh. but a little okay. sweeter. Um, Sounds like we're going to have to look that up and make it a monthly special. <laughs> it, it was deli- I mean, I literally got that every day for 10 years and not every day, but every time I went there for 10, I mean, they just, I didn't change. I got egg drop soup, that fried rice. Like it was, that's my dish. Uh, I like beef and veggie uh, when it comes to Chinese food and fried rice. That, those are my, those are my uh, jams. I, I found it here. Princess beef is a very similar dish to Mongolian beef. It, uh, depending on where you came from, they call it different things. Okay, right on. Bam. I didn't know. Zam, I'm glad you looked that up. I've had all this time. I could have Googled that. I never did that. Uh, yeah, that's my dish. That was my, that's still my go-to dish. Uh, love that dish. We, we did our research and we started looking at different cities and we're like, where should we expand to next? Um, and a, apparently the data shows that Dallas is one of the most obsessive cities over Chinese food, Chinese American food. I, I believe that. A hundred percent. They're <laughs> everywhere. There's look, they actually have a lot of Asian food in uh, Dallas, Los Colinas, if you will. There's a lot of Vietnamese and Korean food. I've been to some of the best and, and you know, not to use the word authentic in authentically, but these are like real authentic places, you know, that my Korean friends will take me to. It's like, Patrick, they don't speak English. OK, this is where we're going. We're going to have the best time. There's order a bunch of food and beer. And then, you know, I don't remember who I am the next day, but yeah. the food is delicious. There's so many options. Uh, yeah. There's so much food. I, I believe that 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 makes a lot of sense because a big yeah. Metroplex, too. Right. You've got the Forward. surrounding stuff. Yeah. yeah. And everything in between. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, guys. I can't wait for you all to come to Dallas. That That is uh, for sure. But look, I come to Austin all the time. So especially for work, that that's still going to happen. So. You know, I'm definitely going to. And before I go, man, I'm going to have to order some food. That, that's just going to happen this weekend. I'm going to get some food. So right. well, anyway, thank you guys so much. Uh, I'll let you guys get back to it. I know you guys got a lot of stuff to do. So, again, thank you all so much for your time. If you ever need anything, please feel free to uh, to reach out um, at any time. So no worries there. Uh, and again, thank you all so much for your time. My best to y'all's families and just uh, be safe during this time and to y'all staff as well. I hope I uh, uh, wish them the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Patrick. All right, Thank guys. You. Y'all have a good night, okay? Get some rest. All right. You too. All right. Take bye-bye. Care. All right. Bye. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed this format today for these interviews. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And uh, again, don't forget, you can check out both of these interviews unedited on our YouTube channel, The Lone Star Plate Podcast. As always, thank you for listening. Love you to death. The Lone Star Plate Podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more. We're using fresh, 
artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Music